The Lieutenant Governor transmits herewith Bill No. 30, entitled Liquefied Natural Gas Project Agreements Act, and recommends the same to the Legislative Assembly. Minister. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to introduce Bill 30, the Liquefied Natural Gas Project Agreements Act 2015. This bill provides the authority for the Minister of Finance with the approval of the Lieutenant Governor and Council to enter into LNG project agreements on behalf of the province. I am pleased to rise and speak to second reading of Bill 30. Uh, and I move second reading of Bill 30, the Liquefied Natural Gas Project Agreements Act. And the agreement uh, that we are about to debate is founded on three principles. The first, ensuring that British Columbians get a fair share of the benefits of a resource that belongs to them. The Premier did say that there will be up to 4,500 jobs at the peak of construction with respect to the Petronas proposal for Lilu Island, not yet approved by the Environmental Assessment Office, not yet approved by the Laxville Lambs people whose traditional territory Lilu Island is in, and certainly I would argue if you had a chance to talk to the Chinook and the Coho in the Skeena River, they haven't been consulted on this, and it's important that somebody speak for them as well. Now, how someone could automatically be opposed to the largest capital investment in BC's history is absolutely mind-boggling, Honourable Speaker. This deal represents a generational opportunity. Pacific Northwest LNG would be a $36 billion US dollar contribution, a total build-out and operation investment in northern BC that would be a key driver of jobs and economic activity in the province. So I do find it quite bizarre in Canadian funds, we're talking about a $40 billion investment that the opposition is taking uh, such, a, such a, 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 a confrontational stance on this. I mean, this is, this is monumental. This isn't taxpayer money. This is private investment in the province of British Columbia. Uh, I'm sure if uh, the government was uh, borrowing $40 billion for a venture, uh, the opposition would be quite, uh, quite happy to uh, see that type of, uh, type of deal go down. But this, this, is, this is private money, it's investment, and uh, this is something that is going to be absolutely groundbreaking for, uh, for British Columbia. What we have said is that BC resources need to deliver BC jobs. First and foremost, it needs to be British Columbians who get the work. It needs to be Canadians who get the work. We have said that an LNG industry needs to have a fair return to the BC Treasury, and that return has to be evident. We have said that an LNG industry needs to provide effective protections for air, land, and water in our province. And we have said that there needs to be a partnership with the First Nations where everybody benefits. Those are the conditions that we have put on our support. And the project development agreement does not deliver on those conditions. We're for it. You're against it. We're for growing the economy. You're for stifling the economy. BC LNG is good for business. It's good for British Columbia. So let's look at some of these details, OK? We sat here and, de and debated the LNG tax only a few months ago, Honourable Speaker. And as everyone knows, it was initially announced that it might be up to 7%. At the end, it was halved, and we supported that. Why? Because I think everybody on this side of the House recognized that half was probably where we were going to end up anyway. So we supported it to show our support for the, for the uh, burgeoning LNG industry, Honourable Speaker. Mr. Speaker, royalty revenues of $3.64 billion, LNG income tax, of over $697 million, corporate income tax of $1.2 billion, and PST of $1.26 billion. Motor fuel tax, Mr. Speaker, of $462 million, and property tax to local government of $253 million, Mr. Speaker. But when I look at the project development agreement with, the, again, the hindsight of looking back at the Premier's commitment to 100,000 jobs, not 
one paragraph, not one sentence, not one syllable committing an offshore company, a, a product of a national government, the Malaysian government, not one syllable committing that company to providing jobs for British Columbians. Their own documents suggest quite the contrary, that they will be using numerous temporary foreign workers. Temporary foreign workers, Honourable Speaker, are not a path to citizenship. It's a return ticket home if the boss doesn't like you. It's sub-average uh, sub wages and working conditions that have been exposed in this place over the past decade. Again, I commend that to the Premier's reading when she flies across the country to her next gig somewhere else. Uh, Mr. Speaker, one of the most exciting uh, initi initiatives we have embarked on uh, is the LNG by BC program. In November 2014, the LNG by BC program was launched so that BC companies can get involved in the LNG industry and profile their goods and services to proponents and their contractors. Uh, they, this will allow BC uh, business owners to grow their networks, uh, develop new partnerships, and secure new business opportunities in northern BC. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the response to this uh, initiative uh, has been overwhelmingly uh, positive. Uh, British Columbia's uh, business owners uh, want to be part of this uh, new market. Uh, over 300 companies uh, have uh, pre-registered with this program and offer a range of services uh, from accommodation, uh, catering, construction, finance, and insurance to recycling. Uh, this goes to uh, demonstrate the broad range of skills and cap capabilities that uh, BC businesses have to offer to LNG sector. The Premier has sold out BC families and BC workers for political purposes. We support the development of LNG for BC. We have always said it needs to meet the conditions of a fair return to British Columbians who own the resource jobs for every British Columbian ready to be worked, work or train, protection for our land, air and water. Now they say that they're in favour of LNG. I just heard the member from North Coast say yes. uh, that she's in favour of LNG. Well how can you be in favour of LNG when you are absolutely opposed to fracking? Where does she think the gas comes from? Honourable Speaker, where does the NDP think that that gas comes from? It comes from the Northeast. You know how that gas gets out of the ground, mm -hmm. Honourable Speaker? Well, you have to use the technique of fracking to get that gas out of the ground. So if you're opposed to fracking, Honourable Speaker, and I believe that the NDP in British Columbia is formally opposed to fracking, yep. then you are opposed to the development of LNG. Second, we're protecting the environment. This agreement spells it out, and uh, members of this legislature will get a chance to look at that. In British Columbia, we are determined to ensure that we have the cleanest LNG facilities in the world with the highest benchmark. Probably some MLAs on the opposite side would support it. Those uh, MLAs who depend more on union support, perhaps. Might, might like to support this bill. But there are some who don't like fracking on principle. There are others who are philosophically opposed to the use of fossil fuels in any way. Others might reject the use of foreign workers. Some may not like development, period. They might like to rather leave the land alone. Or they oppose the use of ships to carry LNG. Well, we can answer these objections, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we all know that there's never been a contamination of water through 50 years of fracking that 75% of water used in fracking is now recovered and used again, that fracking is safe and becoming more safe and more efficient all the time. We could point out that in developing LNG, we're making the world a cleaner place because China will substitute natural gas for coal. We could say that LNG ships have been carrying LNG for 50 years. In fact, they've completed 77,000 trips without incident. So these principled objections, I can understand, but they can be answered. And just in May, the Gitsan chiefs were visited in Ansbayach 
by this government's highly paid LNG advocate, Gordon Wilson, who told them in regards to fracking, and I will quote, the water you put down the well is not drinkable water. It doesn't start out as drinkable water, end quote. Well, Honourable Speaker, many of the chiefs and their House members have been to the northeast part of this province and saw the trucks filling up at rivers and lakes and even at the Williston Reservoir, so they knew this wasn't fully accurate or totally honest. Uh, we, we hear from the members opposite uh, that we, we, you know, they, they support uh, uh, LNG. And we hear from some of their members uh, that, that very clearly don't support fracking. And we try to point out to the members opposite that uh, if you cannot export it if you don't extract it. And I know, that's a, I know that's a tough one for the members opposite to understand, but if you don't actually get the natural gas out of the ground, you can't, you can't send it overseas. You can't generate the, the, the types of revenues uh, that British Columbians will come to re rely upon for health care and education and other critical services in this province. Uh, the, uh, the, the member from North Island said, uh, said this week uh, that she fears that this LNG project will set a dangerous precedent for the province of British Columbia. Oh, golly. New Democrats, like most British Columbians, want to see an LNG industry that protects our land, air, and water, including our climate change commitments. But the Premier's LNG deal lets Petronas help write its own environmental regulations. Fact, the project development agreement signed by the BC Liberal government with Petronas gives the company the right to negotiate with government on the environmental regulations that will come into force when the Greenhouse Gas Industrial Reporting and Control Act is enacted. These rules will apply to all future LNG facilities as well. Fact, the rules the company helps write will be locked in for 25 years, meaning a future government that wants to improve environmental measures will have to pay the company back for any cost it incurs as a result. It's hard to believe that in 25 years we would not be improving our commitments to fighting climate change and reducing greenhouse gas gases. Fact, the agreement also protects the company from changes to the carbon tax on LNG production for 25 years. Fact. The government already legislated an exemption of 70% of GHG emissions from the benchmark LNG facilities are required to meet. Looking at the GHG impacts from the marine facility without looking at the impacts of the product we're putting into the pipes from upstream is pretty selective and doesn't capture true impacts. Then, of course, we come to the environmental assessments and the whole environmental assessments. Well, actually, yes, the First Nations have raised concerns, legitimate concerns, and in fact, we have seen the proponents respond to that with new uh, bridge, uh, new terminal design along the Skeena River in order to address that. And, of course, we have the federal assessment that is continuing to go on at this time. And that will be uh, another piece of oversight in the uh, whole environmental side of things. When we debated the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Profile Bill last fall, it did not take into consideration 70% of the emissions upstream. The commitment was, and I, and I remember it well because it was alliterative, from wellhead to waterline. Most people assume that means from where you get it out of the ground to where you send it offshore to someone else. Everything was going to be covered. We were going to make sure that we had the greenest LNG in the world. Well, turns out 70% of that is not covered. The Minister of Environment is prepared to go to the wall on that. I, 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 I just ask her to take a um, phone up uh, uh, Matt Horn from the Pemba Institute. You've got him on speed dial. You've just appointed him to your climate action team, and he sees it differently. Third, fairness. Making sure that investors have certainty. Making sure that the business community in a competitive global environment knows that British Columbia is a place that they can make their investment and create jobs and know that they will be treated fairly. The bill describes the four areas of change for which the province grants an indemnity under an LNG project agreement. These are the only areas of change for which an indemnity is provided and they are changes to the Liquefied Natural Gas Income Tax Act, changes to the Natural Gas Tax Credit under the BC Income Tax Act, changes to the Carbon Tax Act that are specific to the liquefaction of natural gas, and 
Fourthly, changes to the greenhouse gas regulatory framework that will be set out under the Greenhouse Gas Industrial Reporting and Control Act and in the liquefied natural gas environmental incentive program described in the documents uh, table today. The Premier negotiated an LNG that benefits foreign-owned corporations first and puts British Columbians last. This is a worldwide market and it is extremely capital intensive. It requires large amounts of capital committed for the long term <coughs> to put in the necessary infrastructure to make this opportunity available. It is difficult to assemble this capital and difficult to assemble the necessary technology. That requires certainty. No investor will go into this space unless they are guaranteed a stable playing field for many years to come. This government, because of its approach, because of its attitude, because of its fiscal record, and because of its underlying philosophy, is prepared to provide that certainty through this bill, which is before the House today. Last fall, when we were debating the tax framework, the tax framework for liquefied natural gas, it came in at half what was advertised. The government campaigned at 7%, and they introduced a tax at 3.5%. And we supported that. We were unhappy that it had been cut in half without any explanation. There wasn't any documentation to provide it beyond the spin from the Minister of Finance about, well, it's as good as we could get. But we said we'll support that because the investment community needs to have certainty. They need to understand what the terms of reference are coming in. We support resource development. We support the development of an LNG industry as part of a diversified, value-added, modern economy. We support access to training and post-secondary education so that people get the opportunity to participate in this economy to the best of their ability. So on one hand, before we ship a single molecule, we have created a framework that needs to encourage investment in this province and, re and in research and development of more green energy and more pollution and emission mit mitigating technology. There has never been a more important time. We have made commitments to a large industry about their responsibilities for emissions. And this, this is a creative way to create new industries, new skills, and new markets for things that we don't know or, need, or even need to, or even know we need. So let me be clear, LNG is not BC's economic engine, but it is going to help grow and rev up that engine. LNG is not a panacea for every ill that faces us us as a province, but it does mean private sector investment, the likes of which we have not seen in this province, and with it, jobs, thousands of jobs. A deal that perpetuates an outdated economic view. Honourable Speaker, it locks the people of this province in for 25 plus years to tax rates Petronas and its partners have dictated to this BC Liberal government. Any changes to the LNG income tax, the natural gas tax credit, or the carbon tax, specifically on LNG, that will cost companies more above a certain threshold will require compensation from the BC taxpayer dollar for dollar. Sometimes I wonder, also Honourable Speaker, does the NDP really believe that you don't need private investment, you don't need entrepreneurs, you don't need risk takers. Everyone can just work for the government. Everyone can just work for the government. That's, that's the end of it. There's no need to, uh, to create industry. What this agreement does is indemnifies Pacific Northwest and anybody else who will sign this deal moving forward, and I'm sure there'll be lots of, lots of encouragement. It indemnifies them on the tax side, around uh, LNG-related taxation, around any LNG-related costs, around climate impacts and protecting against climate impacts and costs. What it does not do is it does nothing to provide any guarantees for jobs, it does no for British Columbians, any guarantee for jobs for British Columbians. It does nothing to guarantee any kind of local purchase. It does nothing uh, in terms of of looking at how the public interest um, is protected moving forward on some of those critical issues around air, land, and water. No guarantees in these areas, yet significant guarantees for the company, indemnification I think is the term that's being used, significant guarantees for the company around their costs. 
If we're going to provide certainty, the question has to be, how come the certainty is not provided for British Columbia? How come British Columbians aren't realizing any of that certainty? Uh, what we have always said is we are supportive. We are supportive of the L LNG industry, liquefied natural gas industry for British Columbia. But we have said since the beginning that this has to be a good deal for British Columbians. And there are four conditions that we believe need to be met in order to qualify as a good deal for British Columbians. And the first qualification is that this has to be has to provide a fair return to British Columbians who, don't forget, we own the resource. Now we know there have been two pieces of legislation already passed. The first one around royalties. We passed that earlier this year. You will recall the minister responsible uh, was up uh, months and months before that talking about a royalty regime, a 7%, uh, talking about our ability to make wonderful returns here. Of course, once we got to the actual table, once that legislation was put on the table, seven had become three and a half. So we cut the royalty regime in half. Now, this side, reluctantly, but we supported that. And we supported that because we understood that the royalty number had to be in play. That it was fair game to say companies needed to know what the royalty number was if anybody was going to move forward. So we supported that. The second qualification is that there has, there has to be jobs for every British Columbian who is ready to work or be trained. Northwest BC has gone through a long period of time, decades of struggling economically. Uh, just never seemed to be able to catch fire when so much else of the province uh, can, uh, is, is performing. They always have higher unemployment rates, uh, always struggling to find uh, things and opportunity and optimism to be able to, to grasp onto. Liquefied natural gas presents that opportunity for Northwest BC. Think about the, the, the community of Port Edwards and how it's been struggling along. Uh, you know, it's, it's fallen from its, from its previous uh, glory in terms of the fishing and other industries that it was involved in and, and forestry side. And now it has an opportunity to regain some of its past and to grow positively into the future. You think about Prince Rupert and what liquefied natural gas means for the community of Prince Rupert. For an opportunity to see that community renewed, to see growth throughout the area. When you look at Kitimat and what it will do for, for, the, for the community of Kitimat and the boom that is already happening in Kitimat and the growth that will happen. And right across my riding of Nachaco Lakes, Hundreds of kilometers of pipe will be placed, thousands of jobs will be created uh, through, that, uh, through that period of time, new skills and training opportunities created, and then to the northwest or northeast with the extraction industry and the opportunity for growth uh, and really for the whole province to think more positively about what could a petrochemical industry mean? What, could we, what can we do now that we have this potential opportunity that's in our grasp? The third qualification that will provide a fair deal for British Columbia is that any deal needs to protect our air, our land, and our water. At the same time, the government brought forward legislation to deal with climate-related initiatives and the impacts of LNG on climate. But what we know, of course, is that legislation essentially left 70% of emissions off the table. 70% of emissions were left off the table. And we opposed that legislation because it was not legislation that would provide and deliver the kind of protection that we say in our four conditions for land, air, and water. Rather, the vast majority of those emissions got a pass. And when this government talks about the cleanest LNG anywhere, it's just simply not true. It's just simply not true. And this legislation that we passed earlier kind of give, opens the door for that to be the case. Plan to put the BC Oil and Gas Commission in charge of regulation of LNG terminals on federal lands. 
Talk about putting the fox in charge of the hen house. Especially worrisome, Honourable Speaker, are the broad exclusions described in Section 11 of these federal regulations now on the Can Canadian Gazette. And this is what they say. Unless otherwise provided by these regulations, a provision of incorporated law that imposes an obligation, liability or penalty on an owner, occupier, public authority, public body or unspecified person or entity does not apply to Her Majesty in the right, in right of Canada or to the Prince Rupert Port Authority. It's essentially saying, Honourable Speaker, that laws that would generally apply to the port will only do so if expressly required by regulations, regulations set by the Oil and Gas Commission, uh, uh, Honourable uh, Speaker. The effect of this precision would be that laws of general application would no longer apply to the port, making it above the law, Honourable Speaker. It could mean that the port could operate nearly independently of the Oil and Gas Activities Act. What I wanted to say is that it means now that the port could operate nearly independently of the Oil and Gas Activities Act, Drinking Water Protection Act, Environmental Ma Management Act, Species at Risk Act, and any other laws that could be required to protect environment and public health. This is the extent of the giveaway, Honourable Speaker. Now, with the passing of this bill, Honourable Speaker, we will be locking ourselves into an untested LNG income tax regime and signing away our ability to fix any unforeseen problems. We will be solidifying tax breaks demanded by industry in negotiations with a desperate government. And we'll be throwing away our climate targets and the commitments we made to them and selling out the next generation. An LNG export industry and our climate targets never could have coexisted. And you don't have to believe me, Honourable Speaker. Government can ask its own civil servants who've been advising this, them of the same thing for several years. And the fourth qualification. And for many, this is perhaps the most important. This deal has to represent a true partnership with First Nations. And when I think about my portfolio, Mr. Speaker, about First Nations, it's probably worth noting that every single First Nation from the northeast to the northwest of this province has signed one or more pipeline benefit agreements. Every single nation has said that they want to be part of a liquefied natural gas industry. Every single one. On the Pacific Northwest LNG uh, project and the uh, ga Prince Rupert gas transmission line, there is every nation has signed on to that but two. And we're working with those two nations and we're going to continue to work with those nations because they want to see these benefits as well. And Mr. Speaker, on each of those counts, does this provide fair return to British Columbians? The answer is no. Does this provide jobs for every British Columbian ready to work or be trained? trained? Mr. Speaker, the answer is no. Does this provide adequate protection for our air, land and water? The answer is no. And does this deal and does this agreement provide a true partnership with First Nations? Again, Mr. Speaker, the answer is no.